Titus 1, 5 through 9. Uh, why don't y'all stand with me as we read that? I'm reading from the CSB. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that apart from you, none of us could be men like this, but because of what your son has done for us, Father, you've uh, made us men like this, God. Help us to rejoice in the work that you've done and help us to find brothers like this to partner with us. Would you remind us that you do the work, um, we do the finding. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your seats. We all have horror stories when it comes to leaders. Uh, we've all been exploited or embarrassed, uh, and more than likely, it's gone on more than once. And when something takes place more than once, it becomes a pattern and it starts to shape both your fears and expectations, right? How does this take place? It takes place because you and I initially are trusting of this concept of leadership. It's a good thing from the time that we're born, we have parents, and a parent is supposed to be a good leader, somebody that takes care of you, somebody that cares for you, so you're hopeful, and this is why bad leadership hurts so much because it hurts to deposit trust in somebody and withdraw tears. It sticks to you. Good examples roll off like water, but the bad ones, they hitchhike like gum on the bottom of your shoes, right? It's hard for us to recall all of our bad school teachers, but or, or, it's hard for us to recall the bad ones, it's hard for us to recall the good ones. Y'all get what I'm going? Uh, but we remember the bad ones. You remember the Miss Deaver, not Dever, the Miss Deaver in kindergarten that would take those Lee press on nails and grab you by the arm. They don't leave. It's also hard because you quickly find out that you can't hide from the bad effects of leadership. Even if you remove all of the bad ones, somebody else is going to spring up. Because people are going to start to lead and influence and people will follow. So this is not a problem that we can ignore. It's something that we have to address. And there's no uh, uh, sphere of life that is absent of its pitfalls, especially in the context of the church. We've all seen it, as we've heard of stories of church hurt. We've seen of pastors that are supposed to care for God's family, but through adultery have become homewreckers. We've seen prosperity preachers who find themselves in context where they're preaching about God's blessing, but often they're the only ones that are living above the poverty line. We've seen folks that will step on people's backs to advance themselves never thinking that they should step down and wash the, feet of the, wash the feet of the people that are low. And as these accounts go viral, here's what doesn't take place. People that are affected by bad leaders in the church don't just have an opinion of those leaders and that church. They form an opinion of the church and Christianity. And what you quickly find out is that in order to make somebody punt and completely do away with something that God said is good, 
you don't need to convince them of, their, of its badness. All you have to do is make them suspicious of its goodness. You and I know what it's like to try to start a church or to go into a new church or an old church and try to change it. And you have a bunch of people that don't hate you. They're just suspicious of leaders. I think Paul finds a young pastor in the same place and he knows something I think that we all should know, that in our task to reach out to the whole world, that task of reaching the world begins with cleaning up the inside of the church. And as Paul leads off in this letter, he tells Titus to take the lead in establishing the right leaders. And that's what I want to do in our time here. Um, and I love how Paul starts off here, and he gives us what it is that we're to look for because I think that when people suffer an abuse of power, it makes them lower their standards on what they want. People leave an abusive relationship, and they don't have high standards. They just want somebody that doesn't beat them. Isn't it such a great thing that God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to lower our standards? He doesn't want us to settle. And so here's what he does. It's not just enough for us to have eyesight and see what's wrong. God wants to give us vision, right? I can't sing a lick. I don't know what makes good music. I know what makes bad music, right? I can hear and say that's bad, but I don't know what makes it good. This is what God does here. He gives us new lenses and a grid on how to pick the right leaders. And so he gives us vision, um, things to look for. Y'all remember Where's Waldo? Those books, right? You know, you got the British hipster, right? Regardless of where he is, he's going to have that hat, the glasses, you know, the striped shirt and the, the jeans. He's at the beach. Folks are in shorts and bikinis, and he has all of that, right? You go to those books and you turn it, and what makes it so hard is that you're like, oh, I see a guy with the hat, with the shirt, and with the pants, but wait a minute, he doesn't have the glasses. That's not Waldo. Unless he has it all, it's not him. This is what Paul's going to do here. He's going to give us these three things that we look for, and they may have the hat, they may have the glasses, but if they don't have the shirt, it's not them. Regardless of how much you want it to be them, because you're tired and you just know that you need some help, it's not them. So here's what he gives us. I'm starting to run low on my time, so I'm going to move on. Um, I think the main point that he leaves here is this. Yo, good leaders aren't hard to find if you know where to look. Good leaders aren't hard to find if you know where to look. What I love about God is that this is not where's Waldo. God gets no pleasure in hiding leaders. He puts them right out for us to see. We start here in verse 5. Paul says this, the reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. Paul assumes that these guys um, are easy to look for because you can look at them. They're local. They're accessible. They're plural. There's more than one. Paul assumes that the guys are out there. You just have to know how to pick the right guys. They're shepherds, not movie stars. That among the people, they don't just sit in the back all the time ready to shoot out, but they're going to mix among them. They're, they're going to be there. So Paul's going to give us three things that we're to look at. Look at their closest relationships. Look at their character. And look at what it is that they cling to. Closest relationships, character, and what it is that they cling to. First one, he starts off and he says, look at their family. Are they faithful in the relationships with their family? An elder must be blameless. The husband of one wife with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. 
Um, it's not just about how he treats his wife, but how he treats women. Is this the type of guy that is faithful to his wife emotionally, physically, or if I can create this one word, internetually? Faithful children that are not accused of wildness or rebellion. We plant the seed, we sow, God is the one that brings the outcome. Is this the type of man that is sowing the right seeds into his kids? We don't have time to go into depth about what this means or what this does not mean, but the conclusion that he just wants to see is, is this man faithful? Is his Christianity doing any good to the people that he's spending the most time with? If it's not, then what makes you think that it's going to do any good to the people that he spends less time with? He brings this up. Family is a good test because God wants you and I to know that when he talks about the church as family, he doesn't use the term the way that I did when I grew up, like people that were my play cousins. They weren't really my cousins. I just called them that. And I acted like there was a great affection that I had for them until they got in trouble. And I was very, very clear, they're not my real cousins. They're just my play cousins. Listen, in eternity, one thing that you and I are going to see is that the earthly family united by the common blood that we have is beautiful, but it's only a shadow of our eternal family, which is united by Christ's blood. So in one sense, the eternal family that we share in Christ, that we'll share in eternity, is of more value than the earthly family that we have right here and now. And so I think that the test, and here's what we've done at our churches for the past nine years, is we've said, all preferences aside, when we're getting ready to choose somebody to be an elder, if I were to die and go to glory, is this the type of man that I would entrust my wife and my daughter to? And if I did, am I confident that if God blessed his work in their lives that I'd see them in glory? Or do I doubt that he would sow those seeds? If I doubt it, I want to care for my eternal family, the same way that I care about Chandra and Ava. So one of the things that you can look at is, is he faithful in his closest relationships? Is he fruitful in his character? That's two, right? Um, he must, uh, verse 7, as an ov 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 overseer of God's household, he must be blameless. Not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. I think here's what he does. He has this look. How does this man react when he gets attention? Does he draw more to himself? Is he prideful. When he's wronged, does he fight, right? So the first list starts off with all of the knots, right? You don't want somebody that reacts like Proverbs would say is a fool. But then he goes on and says, no, no, no. It's not just enough to have somebody that doesn't do the bad stuff. How does he react? But two, you want to look at uh, how does he relax? When there's no requirements of him to do anything. How does he use his home? How does he use his time? What makes him laugh? What does he love? Is he somebody that's going to use his freedom to proactively care? Or is his relaxation and freedom all for himself? We want men that are fruitful in their character. And then thirdly, you want somebody that's firm in their convictions. Look at what he clings to, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. 
what he's saying is that when it comes to this gospel message, the fact of this God that came to save sinners that didn't deserve it, not just to set us free, but to make us a part of his family, does he see that as his lifeline? I'm not a swimmer, so I have a life jacket whenever I get into any body of water that is taller than six feet three. And what I do is I cling to it with my life because I know that it's my lifeline. Say whatever you want, but you're not going to get me to let go of it. Does this man treat the gospel like that? Does he run ahead of it? Because he fears being irrelevant or left out. Does he say more than God's word says? Does he lag behind it? Does he say less than God's word says because he fears being rejected? Does he talk about holiness but ignore the justice? Does he talk about justice but ignore holiness? Are his values for sale? Or does he hold on like a non-swimmer? does he see the main problem with the world as sin and not the symptoms? Does he see the solution as a savior and not our response? And in holding on tightly to it, and a man that sees the gospel as the solution to every problem, here's what he does. If he finds a group of people in the church that are struggling with legalism, the same gospel message, the same truth. He goes like Paul in Galatians and says, y'all need to believe something about the security of the relationship you have in God. You, you don't have to do anything else to earn it. But then as he sees a group of folks that are wrongly believing in the se- security, like they have it, but they just need something more, Like Paul in 1 Corinthians, what he's saying is, hey, y'all need to believe in the sufficiency of the gospel. That Jesus is all that you need. That you don't need somebody else to give you value or worth. The church, you're married to Christ. You don't need to sleep with prostitutes. Two different problems, but the same gospel. This is a guy that holds firmly and clings to it Why? Because there's two things that he has to do, and Nick did a masterful job of this. When he says he needs to be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. That is, we're trying to find men that hold firmly to the gospel. What you'll run across often is men that may never correct anybody, or they only correct people. And we don't want that. We want somebody that has both of those voices. When people that are weighed down come to them, do they leave more weighed down or lift it up? Nobody is ever discouraged towards faithfulness. You want somebody that can refute Not just spot a counterfeit, but stop it. Listen, not just just drive out wolves, not just rebuke them, but at the end of this first chapter, what Paul's saying is, no, I want you to rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. That wants to see their salvation not their damnation, that wants to win the antagonist, doesn't just want to win an argument. You want somebody that clings so tightly to the gospel and knows how to wield it? Because when you find yourself in the context of a church, there's a cross section. There's people that are not doing spiritually well and they don't know it. They need to be challenged. There are people that are not doing spiritually well. And they know it. They need to be helped, instructed. There are people that are doing spiritually well, and they don't know it. They need to be comforted. And there are people that are doing spiritually well, and they do know it. They need to be 
encouraged. There's this cross-section, and you want somebody that is held so closely to the gospel, has clung to it, that they know how to use that same weapon. They know how to yield it for so many different results. I think what Paul's trying to get at here is, hey, you want to find somebody that when you are around them and people are around them, they want to look more like Jesus. We've read this. It's been said before. None of the characteristics here are extraordinary. And so it just helps us see, hey, we want to find guys that do the ordinary things God has called us to do extraordinarily well. Three and a half years ago, my brother passed away. He was a pastor. Um, and this past, uh, uh, about six months ago, I got a card in the mail, and I just want to read the card to you from a guy that I didn't know. He says this, John, I pray that this note finds you well. I'm writing to tell you of how much your brother Sam meant to me. I met Sam while I was in Memphis. I linked up with him at the church that he pastored. Sam explained the gospel to me like never before. It changed my life. I would join his discipleship group until his death. I owe so much to him. I still think about him daily. I'm in training for full-time pastoral ministry. My journey started with a talk a conversation with your brother. Again, I just wanted to tell you what he meant to me. I know hearing stories of the effects of your loved ones had on someone helps the grieving. I do hope our paths will cross. He did the ordinary things extraordinarily well. I'm grateful that this brother thinks, of, thinks about my brother often, but I'm more grateful that every time he thinks about my brother, he thinks about the Jesus that my brother told him about. I want you to know, if you look at how a man is faithful in his close relationship, how his character is fruitful, and how firm he is in his convictions, you are likely to see that there are qualified men that you just haven't seen yet in your church not because they're not there, but because they're working to be seen in God's sight and not yours. They're not hiding. God has not hidden them. He's placed them right there. Pray for them. Look for them. Find them. Celebrate them. Bad leadership does stick. But good faithful leadership in the context of the church, has the ability, has the potential to be used by God to change the eternal destiny of people that may be your foes right now, but one day you'll find out that they're your truest family.